forward to this study and we're starting today focusing on Luke chapter 8. It's verses 26 through 39. If you have your Bible, please go ahead and open or grab your Bible and flip through the pages to find it. The story is of Jesus casting out demons. If any of you have studied the Bible over the past, you may already know this story, but it's always good to look again to see what the Holy Spirit is speaking in the message to us in a new way. But before I get into that, I do want to make a comment about what a superhero is. Superheroes are people who are loved. They are loved heroes. They are always, through history, someone who is loved. For example, in Greek, Greek culture, there was the famous person, Achilles. The warrior, it's a a successful story in the fight. And then another, maybe today that you may know, an example you may have today, is Marvel Comics. These are pretty popular. You may know a lot of movies and a lot of shows that are Marvel. So I often look at this and consider, if I had a superpower, what might my superpower be? If you have any preference or superpower, go ahead and make a comment what your superpower would be but we become fascinated with this because we look there and we see the good guys they help people they save and they protect from evil we are fascinated drawn into that so maybe we also know that these we also know that these are not real Stanley the famous man Stan Lee was the one who created these characters, and he actually just passed away. But we know that these stories are not true. However, we can look to the person who really is our hero. We can look to the Bible, Jesus himself. Jesus is our hero. Jesus has the power. He has the authority. And we recognize that good and evil forces are working in the world. We have Jesus, the angels. Yet there is also the enemy, there is the devil, and there are demons. And there is a constant tension in the spiritual world, and that the, the, in the Bible it says we are at a war right now. I want to discuss just a little bit about demons. Before I continue on with the scripture today, honestly, demons maybe are something that seems strange to us. I don't like to talk about demons, maybe. Maybe it seems like demons are only in horror films, and it's just something that we don't want to watch. We don't want to, it means all something that's made up. But the Bible says that demons are real, that demons are working in the world. So I want to go just I drew a brief explanation about demons, just to keep it short, but demons oppose, they are against God's work and seek to destroy his works, seek to destroy what he's doing in the world. There's three Bible verses here that you could look up as well about that. Demons, the Bible says, are actually angels, angelic beings who have followed Satan. Before Satan, his name was Lucifer, and he rebelled against God. He was a fallen angel. He fell from heaven into sin. And now a third of the angels have followed him, followed Satan, and all of that company are working in the world to distort, to destroy. Demons have power. Sometimes we will see the power happen in the world, influenced by demons. But sometimes we will be scared by that power. But really, honestly, it is a limited power. God has full reign and control. Demons, really, whatever God does not want to happen, the demons cannot do. And lastly, Later in the Bible, Revelation chapter 20, verses 10, mentions about how in the final judgment, 
when God will cast, will cast Satan and all of the angels that follow him into hell, called the lake of fire. Really, they will be punished. In the future, they will be punished and forced to stay there forever, no more work in the world. That has not yet happened. But that is what we know about demons. So that just helps us to understand, okay, I get a picture of what it means, what demons are. We get a little understanding to what's been going on in the story. To summarize, the point is that demonic possession and oppression are real. They happen in the world. They are real and possible. Now, to expound a little bit about possession and oppression, I'm not going to try to identify that too much in the sermon because it's kind of a complicated topic, but instead I just want to mention that it is happening in the world, maybe not so much that we see it in our culture, maybe it's not easily recognizable in our culture, but in other cultures like Africa or Arabian, Southern Amer South America as well, Middle East, you may see more obvious representations of demonic possession and oppression. There's stories that you may hear. We also see that in Luke chapter 8. So we're going to go through the story together. I will sign it, stop me along the way. Okay. Verse 26. So we'll start. So now, understand before this, what has just happened is that Jesus has just calmed the storm. Remember the story of Jesus on a boat, and the boat is rocking, a huge storm comes up, and the disciples are saying, we're going to die, we're going to die, why are you sleeping on the boat? And Jesus stands up and says, be calm to the storm, and it literally stopped. The waves calmed down as Jesus spoke those words. The disciples were in awe. And this happened right after that story. So, they're on a boat. They arrive now to the area of the Gerasenes. That area is opposite Galilee. So across the lake from Galilee, the sea. In that time, there would have been non-Jews who lived in that area. So Jesus stepped out onto the land. And now notice, it's just Jesus. His disciples didn't get out of the boat. Just Jesus got out. And the man was there from the city who had, the man from the city was there next to the water who had demons. He had them for a long time. He had worn no, no clothes. And he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When, Jesus, when he saw Jesus, this man cried out and fell down before him and said in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Why? Because before Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, there's parentheses here that Luke, just means an addition that Luke added, a little bit of background information. It says, For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Could not be controlled. It's the demon within him leading him to the desert. I want us to just pause and think about this man. He has been possessed by demons. We're just going to talk about it briefly. We don't know his name. We don't know much about his family history or background. The only thing really that we know is that he has been possessed by demons. His experiences, his emotions would have been constant shame. Embarrassment. I mean, he was naked. He didn't even have clothes on. He was naked. There would be embarrassment with that. He was forced into isolation. Put in a prison of, of sorts and then escaping to the desert. 
no social community alone. And he was not safe from himself. Because the demons were in him and would cause him to do things that he would not be able to control, like breaking forth. That strength is not normal. That strength was not in his own. It was stronger than people's strength. So often we will see people who have a damn possession experiencing these things. Shame, isolation, and being a danger to themselves or the community. So, in summary, people tried to help, but gave up on the man. He was hopeless case. It was impossible. There was nothing they could do. And so they left him. Then he was not a part of this. He's too weird. He's too dangerous. We cannot help him. Pausing again, can you imagine that being with, I mean, that's called hopelessness. You feel like God can't even help you. You feel like you're punished by God. That's probably the way the man felt. As he's wandering around among the tombs, feeling dead inside. And then Jesus shows up. It's interesting here, as we're studying a little bit more about what happened. <coughs> now you remember Jesus told the demons to get out. And the man said, wait, 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 what are you going, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Don't do torment me. Now they have not, left, not yet left the man. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, which means many. For there are many demons, many, many demons have entered him. And the demons begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. So in other words, it's a place deep hell, a place where demons can't do anymore, actually, he said. So it's an interesting question that pops up here. The demons have power. They have done a lot of action. But they're afraid of Jesus. I find that interesting. I find something to ponder a little bit. Why, are the, why would Legion be afraid of Jesus? Two simple answers, really. Jesus' identity and Jesus' authority. The demons, first of all, responded to Jesus saying, What are you going to do with us, Son of the Most High? They recognized, recognized Jesus right there as God's son. In the Bible, in James chapter 2, it says that the demons, the devil, believe in God and shudder. So demons know who Jesus is. They know that he is God's son. Also, the demons know that what Jesus could do. Jesus is, you remember before in the story, Jesus had just calmed the storm? He had just told nature to be still. In the same way, the demons knew that he has power and authority, and theirs is limited. They can't do just anything outside of God's control. And so they are afraid, knowing that they can crumble, that they don't really have any power. So Jesus has complete authority over the demons. And they knew that. That's why they were afraid. Remember, the demons asked Jesus, don't throw us into the abyss. Hell. So now, there's, a, there's pigs. There's a large herd of pigs. And pigs don't understand it in the Jewish culture are not clean animal. Remember, they were living in the in non Jewish area, so the person or the people there taking care of the pigs were not clean. There was begging coming from them please cast us out, cast us into the pigs. The 
the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. It went into the pigs. And then the pigs head into the water. I'm sure you can imagine that picture. What is that? What's going on? This has never been seen before. The pigs are estimated, look in the book of Mark, it says about 2,000 pigs, 2,000 demons and them in one man, all entered into these pigs. Wow. And they went down the bank and died. In summary, really the point here is that Jesus Christ has absolute authority over the demons. Really, there is nothing that Jesus, that God, can't handle. We say demons are real. Obsession, possession, oppression are real. Sometimes we experience maybe emotional ups and downs, things of oppression. Maybe we experience thoughts that are not natural. Sometimes maybe we experience something that just seems strange. It's possible that it is a demon of demonic oppression. If you go on a missions trip, sometimes you will sometimes you will see demonic possession. Because people open themselves up to the spiritual world in that way. It's dangerous. In this culture we practice new age philosophy. New age and sometimes in our culture, and that actually opens people up to the spiritual world. Buddhism also opens people up to the spiritual world. It is possible to experience demonic oppression or possession through those practices. That decision requires to be free from that works with the person who has experienced deliverance in that and be able, knows how to deliver people from that oppression. But when we follow Jesus, demons can't control us because the Holy Spirit has already come to dwell within us. But sometimes believers can experience attacks from the demons. That's oppression when people experience spiritual attacks. Sometimes if we allow that to happen in our lives, if we allow that, it means that if we aren't focusing on Jesus, We may allow things into our life that can bring about the opportunity for that oppression in our lives. And that does happen in the world. Really, Jesus has authority over demons. Demons can't beat Jesus. The next verse... Verse 34. This is the man who was taking care of the pigs, or the people who were taking care of the pigs. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, and the 2,000 pigs going into the water, they had lost all of their income. Of course, they were afraid. Can you imagine that response? So they fled and told us in the city and in the country what had just happened. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus. And they found that man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus. I'm assuming he was sitting there learning from Jesus. He was clothed and in his right mind. He was a normal person again. And that made people afraid. Shocked. In other words,
Jesus freed this man from spiritual chains with words. The hopeless case. This man was a hopeless case. He had no hope. He was stuck in his slavery. He had been possessed by demons, but to this simple response, this simple word, freed him. Jesus freed him from his chains. He was free. And people looked on that in shock, wondering how that happened. If we knew a person or a person in our life who was stuck and had been stuck for many years and, and suddenly had been changed, had a complete life change, we may feel a little bit of fear as well. What has happened to that person? This is not normal. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man... Boy, that man had a demon and he's healed. People saw it. People witnessed a miracle. People experienced... And wondered how that happened. Whatever happened, he was healed. And we don't understand it fully, but I've seen it. It's happened. Look, before that man was naked, he was screaming out and out of control. And now this man's just a regular person sitting there. How? Who is this man? Who is this Jesus man? And there was fear in that unknown. So what's the response? How do people respond? says, then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes. Did they say, come, come, Jesus? No. Instead, they asked him to depart from them. For they were seized with great fear. White face, maybe. Seized with fear. So, Jesus got into the boat and returned. He went back to Galilee. So really, when Jesus does wonderful things in people's lives, people will respond. Now we notice here that he has authority and power. We notice the authority and power of Jesus. Really, there are different ways that you can respond to Jesus' authority and his power and his work in the world. Either a response would be fear. And actually, that's a pretty common response that we face when some with something we don't understand or don't know exactly how it happened. We experience fear, respond with fear. Fear will either draw us to Jesus or make us turn Jesus away from us. Now, it's the same with people in the in the garrisons. They told Jesus to leave. But that man was drawn near to Jesus. There's a principle there. That principle is that many people will ask Jesus to leave. They will not want to draw near to Jesus. And a few will draw to him. What's the difference? The difference is faith. Fear without faith causes people to reject Jesus simple. But what about with faith? Fear with faith leads to a deeper life with Jesus. It will lead us to a deeper worship of Jesus. Our faith involves some fear, and that is normal, because we are faced with something that is in internal, that has no limit of power. He is all-knowing. He is all wisdom. He is creator. He is supreme authority. He has control over everything that's happening. And we face him, and we should experience fear. And that's normal. But are we willing to trust him with faith? Faith means trust. I know all of your power, and I know you are good. I know that you care for me, and I know that you love me. That will lead us to worship, to worshiping Jesus. And that's what the man did. As he sat at Jesus' feet, listening, worshiping, thanking Jesus. 
It's the same with us when we experience the power of God in our lives. When we experience times when there's no hope, there's no future, and there's nothing left. Then Jesus shows up and changes us completely. That shame is no more. There's acceptance now. That isolation is no more. Now this man can go back to having his family again. We become more like Jesus every day. And that's what life with Jesus is like. When we fear, meaning honor the Lord. When we can pray to him with reverence. Meaning respect. Respect of his power. And how he, that can lead us then into a deeper relationship with Jesus. And that's a beautiful picture right there. The reason I comment on these two groups is because we notice that Jesus has a response here to people. People are scared. They say, get away, leave. We don't want you here. And Jesus did not say, okay, well, let me show you something else. I'll make you all believe in me. He didn't say that. He didn't do another miracle. He could just have done multiple miracles and told people that you actually have this thing going on with your skin and I can heal it and I have the power to do that. He didn't say that. He didn't do that. Jesus never forces himself on people. Jesus is patient. He waits for people. These people were not ready for him. Except for that man. That one man. So Jesus got in the boat and he left. But for us, it's the same. Jesus is patient with us. He does the slow work in people's hearts. Softening our hearts that we may receive the gospel. People fear Jesus first without faith and then with trust increasing until we are following him. Jesus is ready for all people who are ready to trust him with our whole lives. This may be the end of the story here. We see this man. The man who experienced the demons and the demons leaving him. And that man begged of Jesus that he may be with him. Please, may I go with you? And Jesus actually told him no. He said no, stay. It's interesting, God said no. That's how we know, just going off topic just a minute. We know then that he can also say no to our prayers. We see that right here. He doesn't always say yes. But he has a reason. But it's interesting, the word right here. It says the man begged him. The man begged Jesus, please, let me be with you. Please, I want to learn more from you. This has been awesome. I don't understand everything that's happening in my life. I want to learn. I want to study. I want to sacrifice and follow you. But Jesus said no. The question arrives for us. How eager are we to be in the presence of our Savior. Every day in our lives, how much do we desire to know Jesus, to come before him, to come before our Savior? You know, the gospel says that Jesus died for us and our sins have been forgiven through the cross. His blood has forgiven, has cleansed us, the shame is gone. The guilt is gone. The fear is gone. We come before him, our Savior. He loves us. Sometimes when we experience his salvation, then we go on with normal life again. Jesus becomes a ticket to our heaven. But that's not what it means to be, have a Christian life. That's not what God wants for us. That's not what he wants for our life. God wants a relationship with us. And that's why he sent his son to die for us. So that we can be reconciled with God again. Through the cross. That reconciliation. And he is our heavenly father. He becomes our father. We become his children. We are children of the most high God. 
Christian life is also a daily walk with Jesus. Walking with him every day. Communing with Jesus. How much do we desire to talk with Jesus? In the beginning, our desire may be little. But one example of growth and faith is when that desire becomes greater and greater for Jesus to be dwelling within us, to experience his presence in our lives. That is called, that is part of sanctification. The sanctification process when we become more and more like Jesus every day. When we desire Jesus more and more and our will is changed to follow his. That's our new identity as believers. We are part of his family and we can relate with him. Jesus then at the end said, go home, go back to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. And that man went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And that's all we know about that man. But you notice here it says proclaiming. It says pro and then it says here the word declare. The word declare and proclaiming. Those two words are both summary words for sharing the gospel, the good news. Sharing with people all over that region that Jesus, maybe Jesus said go back to the city because Jesus, his goal was to go and seek salvation of the lost. First he did that for Israel. Second, the Gentiles. So maybe that's why Jesus knew I can't be everywhere as a human because Jesus is God, but he couldn't be everywhere. He was a human too. So he told him to go home. In other words, tell people the good news of what God has done for you. And then that person became a living, walking testament of what God had done in his life. People later look at him and say, well, I know that person. That was the crazy person. Be careful around him. And then the person can respond, well, I'm normal now. The question comes, how can that happen? Well, I met this man named Jesus, and he cast out 2,000 demons out of me. And I'm a normal person again. God is powerful. He's in my life. And now, I, because of him, I have a normal life again. I was naked. I lived amongst the tombs. I had no future and no hope, but now I have clothes. I live life with living people, and I have a future and a hope. Do you think people would, will ignore that message? No. That man has been changed forever. And that's going to penetrate throughout his community. That's what Jesus told the man to do. I have a little video here I'll just let you watch. Really, this is just a simple video as an illustration just to show what our life looks like. Just a simple illustration of what this man's life looks like. We saw the dog here. This is actually in Chile, and he was stuck. He was all wrapped up in some tarp. It was a covering. And the dog is stuck, could not get out. The dog's afraid, and he's biting, trying to free himself. And a man comes to try to help him. But the dog bit back at the man, not realizing that the man was trying to help him. And then as it goes on, the dog allows the man to cut. He's still kind of scared and biting at him. But it, it seems the dog realizes the man is trying to help him. 
And then once that dog is free, what does the dog do? Does it bolt? No, actually the dog came and licked the man, thanking the man for rescuing him. Stuck in slavery, now free. It's the same for us. Before, we were slaves to sin, but now we belong with Jesus. Our chains have been broken. We are free forever to proclaim the message of hope and joy and freedom to other people who are stuck in slavery. So the question for us is, will we joyfully, like that man, experience Jesus' power and authority in his life and freedom in his life from oppression, from chains, from slavery, of demonic influence? Will we, like that man, joyfully proclaim Jesus to other people to say what Jesus has done in our lives? I know that all of us who are watching have a wonderful story to share about what God has done in your life. Through the best of times and through the worst of times. And for this man here, this was the worst of his life. It suddenly became the best. As we consider that, are we willing to go? Are we willing to obey what Jesus tells us to do? And he says to go to all the country, to all the people groups. Make disciples. First, proclaiming about Jesus. Have you met this man named Jesus? Let me share about him. And then helping him grow in discipling, empowering to go out and to tell other people about Jesus. God is doing awesome things in your life. And God wants us to share with other people 